Today, I am going to explain a period epic film called Mongol, The Rise of Genghis Khan. Spoilers ahead, watch out, and take care. The premise of the movie is set in the year 1172. The current northwestern Chinese provinces used to be called the Tangut Kingdom, ruled by the dynasty of the same name. There lived several Mongolian tribes, led by their respective leaders, called the Khans. The rivalry between the tribes and the hunger for power within them caused several arguments, battles, and deaths. There are no rules in the world of Mongols, and it is in desperate need of a supreme Khan to lead and unite the people. Yesugai is the Khan of a small tribe in the west. At the beginning of the film, he is traveling with his men and nine-year-old son, Temujin, to look for a wife for the kid. At night, they stop at a friend's tribe to take a rest. Temujin is busy tending to his horse when a girl named Bort approaches him and asks him his name. Temujin introduces himself and tells her the purpose of the trip. On finding out he is looking for a bride, Bort confidently claims that he should marry her. Temujin's father wants to bring home a bride from a stronger tribe for politics, but upon his son's repeated request, Yesugai allows him to choose someone from the friend's tribe instead. Before choosing the girl, Temujin is asked to look for one with strong legs, because only a girl with strong legs can keep her man happy. Temujin does as told, and chooses Bort. Their marriage is officiated, but they can only be together after five years. Before leaving, Temujin promises to return soon, and gives Bort a necklace as a gift to remember him. On the way back to their village, Yesugai and the men take a rest near an inn. They are cautious because a few yards away sits the leader of a rival tribe with his men. Suddenly, the rival Khan sends his men with a bowl of milk as a sign of peace. To return the gesture, Yesugai also sends back a bowl of juice. Yesugai's right-hand man suggests that he let the servant drink the milk first, since they cannot trust their enemies. But Yesugai doesn't want to lose the opportunity to make peace because of suspicion. He drinks the bowl clean, and so does the other Khan. A while later, they continue the journey, but a few minutes in, Yesugai's chest starts to hurt. He falls off the horse and dies. It is clear that the opponents took advantage of his kindness and poisoned him. Poor Temujin goes to his father, but his followers could not care less. It is a tradition for the people to only follow a strong leader. Now that their leader is dead, their main concern is to find a new Khan, not to avenge the old one. In the following scene, Temujin and his mother attend Yesugai's funeral. Yesugai owned a lot of cattle and houses, which are taken over by his right-hand man, Targutai. Temujin's mother curses him and claims that her son will kill him one day. Targutai realizes it is true and makes it his mission to kill Temujin. However, they measure his height, which doesn't reach the upper part of the wheel of a cart. According to the traditions, Mongols do not kill a child, which is why Temujin's life is saved. But Targutai promises to return next winter, when Temujin's height will have increased. When winter comes around, Temujin has no place to hide. He remembers his father telling him about God Tengri, who will help him in his time of need. Hence, he goes to the sacred mountain to visit the holy place, but on the way, he accidentally falls into a frozen lake and almost dies. He is rescued by a boy his age named Jamuka. He and his younger brother bring Temujin to their home and give him food. Temujin is grateful to the brothers for saving his life. He offers to be Jamuka's brother by blood. They mix their blood in a bowl of milk and drink it to prove their allegiance to each other. Huh, MGK and Megan Fox aren't crazy after all. The following morning, they are confronted by Targutai and his people, who are still looking for Temujin to kill him. They abduct him and take him back to the tribe. But fortunately for Temujin, his height hasn't grown much since the last time, so he has to be held captive until he grows. A kind old man feeds him every day and helps him with his injuries. A few days later, they measure his height again, but it still hasn't gone up. Suddenly, it starts to rain, and everyone goes inside their houses. The old man takes this opportunity to free Temujin. The kid runs for as long as he can, with the wooden plane still stuck around his neck. He goes to the mountains and prays to God Tengri for help. Temujin then sees a white wolf beside the monument of God, and seconds later, the wooden plane is miraculously broken. The scene changes to 1186. Temujin has grown up into an adult, but is still on the run from Targatai and his people. After a years-long search, they are able to capture him and lock him in a similar wooden plane. This time, he has grown enough to match the height reference, so the chances of his survival are low. Targutai wants to see him beg for his life, but Temujin, being the proud man he is, refuses to do so. 
As a result, Targetai decides to torture him slowly instead of killing him in an instant. The old man who helped Temujin years ago feeds him even now. He begs Temujin to spare his life when he returns to avenge the treatment he is getting. When it gets dark, Targetai comes to Temujin alone and mocks him. Since everyone is busy, Temujin takes the opportunity to attack the opponent and kills him by hitting him with the wooden plane repeatedly. After that, he flees from the village and is safe yet again. Temujin is ready to take his tribe back and become the Khan, but first, he has to bring his bride home. He goes to his in-law's tribe for the first time since he was nine. Bort has grown up to become a strong and beautiful woman, but are those legs thick though? She reveals that she has been waiting for him since she saw him the last time. Temujin receives a coat as a dowry and brings Bort with him. The two go to his mother and sister after several years. They are welcomed wholeheartedly by the family. For the next month, they live the life of their dreams. Temujin and Bort fall deeper in love as spouses, but trouble arises when one day they are attacked by the Merkit tribe. Long ago, Temujin's father kidnapped his mother from the Khan of Merkit. He had vowed to take revenge and is here to steal Bort from Temujin. The couple tries running away, but Temujin is shot with an arrow and Bort is kidnapped to become the wife of the rival Khan. When Temujin gets better, he knows he has to get his wife back, but he cannot do it alone. Hence, he goes to his old blood brother, Jamuka's place. Jamuka has grown up to become the Khan of a powerful tribe himself. He agrees to help, but only after a year because he is busy with a task at hand. A year passes in the blink of an eye, and the two then set off with their troops to attack the Merkit tribe. They kill all of their men and rob the place before finding a pregnant Bort in one of the huts. She has killed a man whose dead body is lying beside her. Temujin immediately claims that the child is his and takes Bort back. At night, the troops celebrate the win. By now, Temujin has been able to gather a bunch of followers. They ask him to distribute the robbed cattle, and unlike most Khans, Temujin keeps only 10% for himself and gives the rest to his troops. He even offers more goods to the family of the men who died in battle. Two of Jamuka's people see this and decide to join Temujin's tribe. Since the Mongols are allowed to choose their own Khans, Jamuka can do nothing about it, but it is evident that he views this as a betrayal. In the following scene, Temujin's soldiers see a man trying to steal their horses. They chase him down and kill him by accident. It turns out that the thief was none other than Jamuka's younger brother. After the incident, Jamuka makes it his mission to kill Temujin, forgetting that he is a brother by blood. He joins hands with another tribe and makes an attack on Temujin's tribe. Temujin knows that his people cannot win the battle because they are heavily outnumbered. Still, he sends the women and children away and makes the men fight with all their might. Even after killing several opponents, Temujin is caught in the end. Jamuka still calls him brother and urges him to beg for mercy. He doesn't want to kill someone who still has strength and pride left in himself. So instead, he makes him a slave and sells him to the brokers. Temujin and the remainder of his men are made to walk several miles across the desert to reach the city that is ruled by the Tangut dynasty. After that, they are kept in the open for people to check and buy as they please. A higher official from the dynasty comes to the market one day and shows interest in buying Temujin. His advisor Monk, however, sees Temujin and can tell he is not the ideal person to be enslaved. He doesn't even have thick legs. He thinks Temujin will be the end of the entire powerful dynasty. The buyer only laughs at the statement and buys Temujin nonetheless. He is then kept in a cage as a freak who people can see and make fun of. The monk visits him every day and begs for forgiveness. He makes a pact with Temujin that if he looks for Bort, Temujin will not destroy the monastery when the time comes. While on the search for Bort in the deserts, the monk falls unconscious and dies. Luckily, he is found by Bort, who recognizes the necklace he has as the one she owned for several years. She figures out her husband is still alive and goes to the city to look for him. Since Temujin is on full display to the people, she doesn't take long before finding him. The same night, she bribes a guard and helps Temujin flee. He is surprised to see that his son has grown a lot and Bort now has a second daughter. She reluctantly had to be with another man to make ends meet and to feed her children. Temujin loves her even more for her sacrifices and tells the little girl that he is her father. The family of four returns to their home in the countryside and lives there happily for a month. The kids love their father and play with him all the time. Then, one day, Bort comments that all Mongols are the same. They steal, rob, and kill. The comment is minute, but it makes a huge impression on Temujin. 
he decides to leave his family to unify as many tribes as he can and create rule in the world of Mongols, even if he has to kill half of the tribes to get there. The three basic rules they have to follow are never kill women and children, fight the enemies till the end, and never betray your Khan. The scene cuts to 1196. As Temujin vowed, he has been able to gather an army of Mongols on his side, unifying several tribes and making a massive tribe of his own. The only obstacle in his way to becoming an absolute emperor is Jamuka, who also has an army of followers behind him. Today, the two brothers stand on the battlefield with their troops for the ultimate fight. It starts, and Jamuka hastily sends the first batch to fight. Temujin has planned the entire war, while Jamuka is spontaneous, which causes many of his men to be killed. After hours of long and hard battle, Temujin wins and captures the surviving enemy troops, including Jamuka. The troops are taken in as Temujin's followers instead of being killed. The gesture makes them thankful and loyal to their new Khan. The old man who once helped him escape is made the advisor of the tribe. Now, the only thing left to do is to make a judgment for Jamuka. The brothers sit with each other and talk about how far they have come in life. Jamuka proudly reveals he would have killed his enemy if he was in Temujin's position right now. This further proves that he and Temujin are not the same because Temujin allows him to run away. Out of respect for his brother and the hustle he has done to create an army, Temujin forgives him and lets him go. Then, we see that Bort, with both her children, has reunited with Temujin and lives with him happily. In the end, it is narrated that in 1206, Temujin was made the Khan of all Mongols, named Genghis Khan. As he had promised, he wiped out the entire Tangut dynasty and rebuilt the kingdom, but left the monastery as it was at the request of the late monk. In the future, he became the founder of the entirety of the Mongol Empire, the largest contiguous empire in history. I also hear he had great legs.